Hello. Welcome to a new episode of our live stream on artificial intelligence in resource applications. My name is Christian. I'm happy to welcome you here. In our previous episode, we were elaborating a bit on, on what kinds of truth can artificial intelligence actually tell. So it was more of a theoretical approach on the things AI is capable of doing. And I was elaborating on, first of all, what is a bit fuzzy about what we consider to be the truth or what we consider the truth and how actually human intelligence in applied settings is dealing with that. And we were also theorizing a bit on how can human resource management facilitate a productive interaction with artificial intelligence. And today's episode will be about clarifying what to expect from AI in applied settings, because there are three important things to mention. First of all, we all know that artificial intelligence works great when decision processes are A, well understood and well established, and B, they make use of a, fix, of a fixed set of inputs. So when we know our stuff, it's quite easy to teach this to an artificial intelligence as easy as it would be to teach it to some human intelligence. But we need human intelligence when the knowledge about what we have to do um, or what will be the correct decision is not yet ready, is yet missing. We don't know completely how to deal with a new, say, problem setting and we have to solve the problem anyway, which is everyday business for human resource experts. And when human resource needs to access or assess the candidate's potential to perform a certain job, then both aspects are very important. Both aspects are very important at the same time. And today, I'm very happy that I can welcome a scientist in our live stream who will share his practical experience. So he works in both domains. And we will be touching questions like, for example, what makes an assessment actually a proper assessment? And we'll elaborate on Dragos' view whether artificial intelligence will be able to bypass these principles or will, will be able to help us bypass these principles. And what kind of risks we're going to take when practitioners try it anyway. So try to let artificial intelligence do things it is not yet capable of. And Dragos also has very strong opinions on how gut feeling and what he calls evidence-based diagnostics relate with each other. So I'm very happy to um, introduce Dragos Iliescu to you. So hello, so thrilled to meet you. This is Professor Dragos Iliescu, our very special guest for today. Dragos, thank you so much for having you here. And thank you for so much for joining our live stream. So may I ask you to introduce yourself to our viewers, please? Yep, uh, the thrill is mutual. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's great to contribute. I'm, um, um, as I sometimes say, I have multiple personalities in a way. So I have two hats on. Uh, okay. One is uh, the, the, the hat of an academic and researcher and the other one of a practitioner and consultant. Um, I am currently a professor of psychology with the University of Bucharest in Romania, but I also am an extraordinary professor of psychology, they call it, with the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. Okay. Uh, um, and I do research and publish and teach uh, uh, related to uh, tests and testing, assessment tests and testing, and industrial organizational work psychology, human resources. Uh, and on the other hand, I've been a consultant for the past 25 years and more, Okay. Eastern Europe, in Western Europe, in Southeast Asia, Australia, South America, and so on and so forth, doing mostly research related to, again, tests and testing and assessment, but specifically assessment related to human resources and work psychology. Okay. Uh, so uh, you, you, you are um, kind of focused on an occupational and not on a clinical background. No, I, I've done uh, both research and uh, consultancy in assessment related to educational settings and contexts mm -hmm. and to clinical contexts, 
test adaptation, assessment frameworks, and so on and so forth. But most of what I do is work organizational. So yeah, I'm an occupational psychologist. This is how I so how I define myself. Yeah. Okay. And where do you get in touch with human resource markets? Like what's the typical, say, application settings in which you work? Yeah, I, I, you know, uh, human resources and work, industrial, organizational, occupational psychology, you have many names for, for this trade, uh, is quite diverse. I don't do everything there. I've done all kinds of things like occupational health psychology and so on and so forth. But mostly, mostly and most what I do, uh, of what I do and uh, what, what I like most is assessment uh, yeah, tests and testing related to work organizational psychology. And most of that is related to recruitment and selection, selection specifically, or mm -hmm. in a larger scheme, if you wish, uh, talent assessment, yeah, talent management, talent assessment. Okay, that, that's very interesting. And where do you get in touch with artificial intelligence nowadays? Yeah, well, uh, artificial intelligence is... Uh, is almost everywhere nowadays. Uh, but in, in my yeah, uh, in in my domain uh, in related tests and testing, um, I, I I do get in touch with it related to research. I do a lot of research on that, uh, mm -hmm. both on the uh, hard assessment part, on the computational computational psychometrics part. We can uh, maybe we'll have the occasion to talk about that. Um, so computational uh, psychometrics, the, the part of computational linguistics that is. Um, uh, uh, infused in in uh, uh, assessment um, and and in human resources, so I do that as a as a, as an academic. I also <laughs> teach a little bit about that, how you train a model and so on. Uh, as a practitioner, um, I I do believe that the promises of artificial intelligence are rather vague, where um, assessment was already very. Um, very proceduralized, yeah. So you, uh, the, uh, you know the promise of of uh, of doing better than psychometric tests. That is something. That I the, yeah, th th this is something that I haven't seen so far. But there are so many other areas in human resources uh, that were very resource intensive, very time intensive from a practitioner point of view, and where uh, um, artificial intelligent. Uh, intelligence steps in, such as, you know, the recruitment process, the break, the background check process, the mm -hmm. interviewing process. So all those things where a human had to put in time and effort, uh, those are now more and more, more taken over by credible applications, be because you also have all kinds of incredible applications. And if you look at the, at the day, you know, very, very, uh, very ambitious promises, and then you look at the data five years later, and there's not much there. Yeah, but okay. credible applications, credible applications in interviewing, uh, body language, uh, you know, uh, uh, assessment of uh, filmed interviews or or, or uh, CVs, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, filmed bios, um, uh, background check. Those those areas are areas where artificial intelligence already has a very very uh, interesting word to say. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, assessments and uh, tests a lot. Could you just outline for our audience what do you think makes a proper assessment with a, uh, which abides by some psychological standard, like a professional one? Yeah, uh, well, um, it's, it's, in a nutshell, it is about science. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's that simple. I mean, you assume that those assessments are scientific. The 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 more scientific are better than the less scientific, and of course, than the non scientific. Mm -hmm. uh, but science plays by a certain set of rules. Okay. Uh, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, in science, in this kind of science, measurement science, um, we have something called psycho psychometrical. Uh, characteristics yeah it's 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 you know voodoo language if you wish yeah uh complicated yeah psychometrical characteristics and, and then you have reliability and validity and so on and so forth but basically what these characteristics show is that you have good measurement okay. in terms of how stable the scores are how little error you have in them that's reliability how much can you rely on them it's you know reliability you rely on them and you rely on them if they don't have error and then in terms of validity, how objective are they? Do they really measure what they pretend to measure? Okay. 
and and people sometimes don't i mean lay people in in this uh, uh, in this domain don't realize how difficult it is actually to build tests that are reliable and valid Sometimes when you look at a good test, you, 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 you know, you look at the items and see, you say, well, okay, I mean, this doesn't sound complicated. I could have written these items. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it seems to be not that complicated, but a lot of effort has gone into that. Okay. The effort is, you know, layer after layer of, of tweaking the items, uh, submitting them to an empirical test. Yeah, to, 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 you know, collecting data, looking at how the data uh, um, and the results uh, uh, look and so on and so forth. So uh, a lot of effort goes into this based on principle, uh, uh, principles of science. And to what extent do you believe that artificial intelligence is able to kind of bypass all this effort? Because that, that sounds, you know, it sounds in a way it sounds too good to be true. Yeah. And, and you know, we learn when we get their age of reason, and that's probably around eight to nine years. Okay. We learn that if something in life is too good to be true, then usually it is too good to be true. It's not true, yeah? Uh, so artificial intelligence helps in the development process of tests, definitely. It can help, it, yeah. Um, uh, it has been shown to have um, significant, to, to be able to, to, to have significant contributions in item writing, mm -hmm. uh, um, in uh, especially automated item generation. Uh, so it, there are areas where you can use artificial intelligence. But by and large, the process is that difficult and that complicated that artificial intelligence cannot bypass the, the, the work of a scientist uh, putting his or her uh, uh, competence in that test, in that creation. Because tests are not that just, uh, you know, they, they are considered acts of creation, yeah? Okay. They, they are protected by copyright law. So they are acknowledged as uh, um, the result of a creative process. Okay. This is very difficult to uh, just, uh, you know, mime based on artificial intelligence or through artificial intelligence. Okay, but um, let me be the devil's advocate for a moment here and say like, yeah, perhaps you don't know what um, artificial intelligence is capable of or can be capable of in some time. So just um, take the challenge. Just tell me what would happen if I just believed in some artificial intelligence being able to bypass all this stuff and come up with a better assessment than you can with all the scientific knowledge behind and so on and so on. What's yeah. the actual risk for the practitioner? Ah, wow. Well, uh -huh. So uh, that's, a, that's a more complicated question. So let's assume, uh, you know, I, I don't say it cannot do that. Artificial intelligence may reach that level at some point of time, but I, I, I want to be very f uh, clear on that. I haven't seen convincing research showing significant incremental validity uh -huh. that means significant uh, uh, improvements over what we already do. Okay. Uh, so, so that's what I wanted to say. But back to your question. Um, there are several, you know, several ways to approach the question or the, the, the answer. First of all, of course, you, you could say um, what, what, what does a professional do with an assessment? Hmm. Um, and getting back to, to my explanation about sifting out and doing comprehensive assessments, so the, the two phases, if you wish, of a selection process. Mm -hmm. um, in the sifting out part, a professional doesn't need to do very much. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you administer usually quick tests, mm -hmm. not very reliable. Uh, you want to have some kind of statistical um, um, uh, rule uh, of decision making. Yeah. For example, you have a cutoff. You mm -hmm. may administer, for example, a uh, um, uh, 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 cognitive ability test. Uh, and then you have a cutoff and you say, okay, people with an IQ lower than 90, I'm, I'm not going to try to hire them. Yeah. So okay. I sift them out. And yeah. So, and so it's easy to administer. Uh, it's easy to make a decision because you have a cutoff. Mm -hmm. Can this be replaced by artificial intelligence? Hell yes. This can easily be replaced by artificial intelligence. Building okay. an assessment. Yeah. Okay. So that's not a big problem. Um, okay. If you go further, what does a professional do, an HR professional will, when doing comprehensive assessment. Well, mm -hmm. when you do comprehensive assessment, it's not that much anymore about, you know, this one is better than the other one. Mm -hmm. 
No, you have two candidates and, and both candidates can be good, but usually they have different strengths. So what you usually say is, I'm going to look at the data. I'm going to look at the whole background of that, of that person. I'm going to look at the interview and of the, the, the impression that I remained with after having that interview. And then I'm going to tell the hiring manager because I, as a HR professional, I'm not going to make hiring decisions. Mm -hmm. I can only counsel the, the hiring manager to do those decisions, to make those decisions. So I'm, I'm going to explain then to the hiring manager, you know, you have strengths and weaknesses okay. for this one and for the other one. You mm -hmm. may want to hire this one, but be aware he's not going to be a team player. He's very good in decision making. He's very good in all, all, all that context. Okay. But he may not be a very good team player. Now, you may want to hire him or her, uh, but you have to be aware of that weakness. And then you have to build the context for this new hire so that the weakness is not expressed. And then for the second person, this one is going to be a team player, but she may not be very good in decision making. So you will have to counterbalance this weakness. So you, you see, it's that kind of a flavor where you, you, you as an HR professional, you're not just a, a test administrator and then you push, you punch the data in and then clung on the other side comes a decision yeah okay so and this is very difficult to be replaced by artificial intelligence uh also never forget uh the, the counseling part when you okay. explain these things to an to a hiring manager and the manager uh takes those things as right because of your professional standing because of your experience, because uh, it's it's going to be very difficult for managers to just accept an, a computer as an interlocutor, you know, as a as a counselor in these uh, um, uh, in these areas. And there have been studies done about that. How easily do hiring managers or, or you know CEOs or you know high ranking professionals that makes that make these kinds of decisions? How how easy do they accept computers on the other side? Human resource managers very often refer to their gut feeling. What do you actually think or personally think? What does this consist of? What does it mean? What is gut feeling actually? I'm I'm don't don't start me on that. I, I mean I'm not a big fan. <laughs> So I'm 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 absolutely not a big fan, um, uh, or or contraire, I would say, of, of, of gut feeling. I uh, why is that? Uh, we have something called evidence-based diagnosis, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based psychology, evidence-based management also. Okay. So, um, is there any evidence, this would an evidence-based practitioner ask, uh, is there ev any evidence that there is something like gut feeling or flair? Does it really work? And actually research has been done on that, on, on medics, for example, on, on doctors or on psychologists, clinical psychologists. How good are they in diagnosis, in clinical diagnosis? Mm -hmm. And even experienced professionals who use their gut feeling are significantly worse in their diagnosis than young professionals using the book. Yeah. So we we do have diagnostic systems. We, we have that. We have rules in, in any kind of diagnosis. We, okay. we should follow those rules. Now. This being said, so so and, and, and why do I say this? Because and why do I contrast this? Because people who say no, you know, flair is more important than anything. There's an art to this. This is okay. Usually, what they say is this is more important than the actual rule. We have decision rules. We have decision trees. Let's use them. They are they are there for a reason. Yeah. It's, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so if we contrast flair and and rule based decision making, I I I would rather have rule based decision making yeah now what isn't what is true is the fact that you you develop a kind of let's call it experience not flair in the <laughs> whole process of applying those rules for example let me give you an example you may have an experienced professional who in a in an assessment situation comes into the company looks a little bit around, talks maybe for five minutes with the managers, and then he says, I know what tests to administer, I know what, which cutoffs to, to use. Mm -hmm. and, and they will say, Flair, I mean, I've been in this situation 20 years, uh, for, for 20 years, I, I smell what is needed here. The decision is very likely going to be a poor one. Yeah, mm -hmm. And then you may have a less experienced person 
coming in and knowing that they have to do job analysis, they have to talk not only with the manager, but also with job incumbents and with what we call, you know, uh, uh, you usually call these people, uh, you know, you call them in many ways, but they are data carriers usually. I mean, who can give me data about this job and the activities and the tasks? You know, people who have done this job uh, for a long time, people who have gone to pension from this job, uh, you know, have retired from this job, managers of that job, uh, peers of that job, and so on. I want to talk with all of them, and I'm not going to only talk with them. I have a job analysis survey, haha, so that has a structure, and I know how to score it, and which question to ask, and, and so on and so forth. So what, what, what I show you here is the whole paraphernalia, if you wish, uh, instruments about doing our jobs, yeah? So, what you develop with experience is more, you know, you get you get more experience in the process of collecting those data, but you need to go through the steps. If you okay. just come in and you say, you know, I have a gut feeling about what needs to be done here, you're very likely going to go wrong. And this is what research shows with the diagnosticians in, okay. in medicine or in psychology or in human resources also. So this is what I don't why I don't really believe in gut feeling. I do believe in professional do work done professionally. I don't think that this can be, um, um, you know, uh, this this can be, uh, 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 you know, you, you can't bring a computer in, and this is what we are talking about, yeah? Artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on and so forth. So you, you can't bring a computer in to dislodge that. Uh, but at the same time, the human side of professional work is not, gut feeling so it's it's not on the exactly opposite side mm -hmm. uh, I, I i don't know if i i don't know if i'm lucid enough in saying this so so i i do believe that people people are also in in theory decision making machines but you base your decision on your professional work going through all the steps all the stages bringing experience in that experience helps helps with the process and so on and so forth definitely yeah but mm -hmm. i wouldn't say you know exactly opposed to the machine is intuition we have no data to show that or mm -hmm. contrary again i say Whenever we try to analyze how intuitive decision making goes in professional situations, the data shows that it goes not worse, significantly, significantly worse than professional decision making. Yeah. So professional reasoning is actually the force that we have to use here. So you obviously have many, many interesting views and ideas on the whole topic. May I be so nasty to ask you what kind of pet projects are you currently pursuing on your own? be it with or without artificial intelligence being involved? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, th there are three that have that I work on now that have artificial intelligence in some shape or form in them. I, I work on a project um, that is tries to crack the nut of automated item generation. This is this is one um, one issue in assessment that was theorized for maybe 20 or 30 years. So we know how to approach that, but it was never really, really very well implemented, especially in the clinical field. Um, so automated item generation, I have a project in automated essay scoring, uh, which means, yeah, because we're very good at, at scoring automatically uh, um, uh, answers that are in some way standardized. For example, if you have a multiple choice test, it's easy to process that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for some things, you, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> Bless you. Yeah. Uh, um, and I'm a huge fan of standardization in assessment, of course. Uh, but in some, in, in some cases, you need people to write things down in their own words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that is very difficult to process automatically. So how are you going to score an essay or, you know, free text? Uh, in a specific uh, context, yeah. So I, I work on that also. And um, then I have a process that uh, looks at decision trees in semi-clinical assessments. It, it, it's actually of, of huge importance for uh, uh, well-being in the workplace, mental health in the workplace. So we specifically look at burnout and job engagement um, and try to um, predict uh, future states of burnout from micro behaviors that people have in the workplace and also from micro 
um, uh, you know, micro reactions, if you wish. Yeah, just a few words said then and then, and maybe a question, a very short question at then and then, and so on. So, and that is also based on artificial intelligence is too much, you know. But I would say, you know, there is machine learning involved in that. Yeah. Given the topics we were just talking about, I bet you might have some ideas of other people who could be as much fun as you are to have as a special guest in that live stream. Do you have, do any people come to mind? And if so, may I ask you to refer me to them? As a yeah, definitely. definitely. I, 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 yeah, I will do that. Uh, there are some fascinating developments here, and maybe you want to have some of those people um, on board uh, and you know discuss with them, uh, like uh, you know automated CV scoring, for example, background automated background check, for example, especially for the younger generation that was very active in you know Facebook and whatever, and then. Um, some of them maybe want those, <laughs> sometimes you want those posts uh, forgotten, yeah? Uh, but then you have automated background check systems now that can, can look in what you thought you deleted from your Facebook, yeah? Okay, okay. Uh, it's also interesting. Um, um, and then it, it also has a, an ethical vibe in there somewhere. Um, yeah, so so there are fascinating evolutions. Uh, 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 systems that can help you, like, like the one that I, I um mentioned previously um that does the, uh, the 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 scoring of the body language inside the interview so mm -hmm. it's not an interview scoring but it helps you in terms of what's happening with yeah um okay. so so yeah there are some people working on really interesting things in uh, uh we, that have applications in human resources and may i may i ask you to connect me with them at oh, definitely i will do that i will do that yep absolutely perfect so thank you very much for our interesting conversation. It was a sheer pleasure talking to you. But um, before we end all this, is there anything you'd like to share with the viewers I forgot to ask? Aha. Uh, there actually is a lot, but you know, we we, we don't have time. So, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the domain, yeah, with that, so yeah, that exactly. The, 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 the joke aside, the domain is absolutely fascinating and we do see a lot of evolution. We, we do see a lot of evolutions there. Um, uh, just, you know, leaving aside the, the simple evolutions, the technical evolutions, there are so many discussions around them. And I, I, will, I, I feel very strongly about that because I, I have this feeling that if we're not part of the discussion, we're going to be part of those who are going to be left to implement what, what is going to be decided. So uh, we have a chance here to discuss about these things, uh, decide what, what flies and what doesn't fly. And we if we don't play the game, if we don't sit at the table and discuss and are aware of what's happening. Others are going to have these discussions and make the decisions for us. Yeah. I see. Then we're only going to be able to implement those and live with them. So, so it is important. It's a nexus. It's a very important moment in in uh, probably in our evolution as uh, as a species here. Uh, so the, for the evolution of humankind. So we should have these discussions as much as possible and as often as possible. So uh, what can I say? Thank you for the opportunity, and it was great talking to you. It was okay. fun for me too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Drogos. Thank you very much. Have a beautiful day. You too. So, as you might tell from the way our chat went, it was pure fun to do this interview. And so we decided to do a follow-up session where we were where we are going to elaborate on, say, the more deeper questions, like for example, what kind of candidate reactions are to be um, expected when candidates are assessed by artificial intelligence? And what role does perceived fairness and the so-called opportunity to perform in a certain assessment situation play? And also, what are the practical as well as the ethical implications for human resource managers who rely on artificial intelligence? So if that sounds interesting to you, I would be very happy to welcome you at 5th of April, 14 CET straight. You can, you can um, save the date right here using your smartphone. It would be very uh, nice to have you with us once again. 
In case you have any thoughts, any feedback or pending questions, please let me know. Just send me an email to livestream at illegal.de. So thank you very much for watching. Once again, please save the date for our follow-up session on Friday, 5th of April, 14 CET. And consider signing up at www.illegal.de slash livestream to allow us to keep you updated. If you like our stream, please share it and bring a friend next time. And if you have any person in mind you'd like to see interviewed here, please let me know. Contact me on my LinkedIn profile or send an email to livestream at illegal.de. So thank you very much. May you have a beautiful day.